Hello, everyone. Welcome to another lecture in GR. I would like to start today with a few remarks on the metric that we introduced onto the manifold. So the me metric that we introduced, or more precisely, the metric tensor, which is defined at every point in the manifold, is physically the mathematical framework, or is the mathematical framework that allows us to measure what physically cor will correspond to proper time. I will explain that um, during this course in more detail, but for the moment, it's just a mathematical structure. So um, at every point in the manifold, we have something called GP. This is um, the metric at that point. And you remember that a metric means or is defined by the property that at that point, it's a two tensor, a zero two tensor. So it takes as input vectors and spits out the number. And the way you should interpret the number is that it's essentially the length of that vector. So I have an object like that. And let's say if I take the square root, that somehow corresponds to the length of the vector V. Without the metric, we cannot really talk about the length. So remember, a, a vector is just defined by the direction in which a curve moves. And so, of course, you could say that if this curve has a parameter which makes it move faster, then it's kind of a longer, it should be a longer vector, but you couldn't really associate to that a number. And the metric will do that. For our purposes, these vectors will mostly in space-time be vectors of course, in the tangent space to, spa to space time. And this tangent space is the space of directions in space time. And it will be convenient then to think of the metric applied to this vector or of the length as something that has the units of time. And indeed, as we shall see, um, it corresponds somehow if we use that to measure the length of the curve to the proper time that passes. But as I said, I will come back to that later. Now, I should start with one remark, which comes up if I say, okay, we have now a measure, we have a means to measure lengths. Now you may ask, what about this whole tensor? Because the tensor takes as input two vectors, let's say um, u and v, so they're both vectors. What does that mean? Or is that even well-defined? So, and let's say, is it well-defined physically? Because you could say, let's suppose we really go there into the manifold or into space-time and, and just measure out space-time. So as I said, because it corresponds to time, it would mean that we measure the time passing kind of between different events. And then we get a number for, for this square root for different directions v. But can we then, this is the question, can we from this number determine what the number would be if we input into this mathematical object two different vectors? And the answer is yes, we can do that. And the idea is the following. Maybe I'll actually better start by saying that the trick is to say, if you are able to somehow determine what G means in the case where the two arguments are identical, then in particular, you can also evaluate an expression like this. So let's suppose you have an experiment somehow, and we will later say what it could be, that tells you what this quantity is whenever this argument equals that one, which is also the case here. Then you will see that by linearity, if you just evaluate this term, we have lots of terms with two vectors um, appearing at the um, appearing in both arguments. So for example, we have from here times here a G U U, but here as well on the right hand side, a G U U, so this cancels. The same for G V V, this cancels as well. The thing that not cancels is U times V, so the cross terms and here U times V. They don't cancel because there's a minus here and here again a minus, so they will actually add. And we have in total four such cross terms, four from two from here and two from here. And because of the symmetry, it doesn't matter in which order I give the argument. So if you, if you actually evaluate that, you just get that number here. Which means that 
if you really are interested in the G of two different vectors, what you have to do is just to evaluate this and evaluate this, which you can do if you already have an experiment that tells you this thing for two identical inputs. So that's just a remark which may be useful later because later I will argue that this is really the thing that you can measure out. So if you are in space time, you can really determine these things. These are experimental, these are mathematical things that are directly, um, that can be determined directly by an experiment. Okay, that was one remark. Now I want to make another remark, which is about the so-called signature of a matrix. And maybe I write um, a short subtitle. So this doesn't actually correspond to a whole subsection in the lecture notes, just a sub subsection. It's um, part of the discussion of metrics. So if I introduce a coordinate system, so a coordinate system means I introduce a chart map. And um, I assume that the point we are interested in, P, so we look at stuff, things at one point, and let's suppose this point is covered, is included in the chart domain. Then we may ask what, I mean, then clearly we, we have coefficients, G, M, N. So as soon as I've introduced a chart map, I, I can write this metric tensor in terms of coefficients. And these form a bit, these can be understood as a matrix. So the, these are elliptic or can be, maybe I just write this, can be regarded as the entries of a actually symmetric, because the metric tensor is symmetric, of a symmetric D times D matrix where D is the dimension of the manifold. Now you probably know from your linear algebra course, that's probably a while ago, but I'm sure you still know that, that if you have a symmetric matrix, then it can be diagonalized using orthogonal matrices. So there's a statement from linear algebra that tells you there exists orthogonal matrix there exists one orthogonal matrix with ele whose elements I also, or entries, I should say, whose entries, I call them U, I, J. Um, so there exists an orthogonal matrix with entries labeled U, I, J, such that the product, so the, what is the product? Product is the matrix with elements given by multiplying these things. So I call this new matrix D. It will be a diagonal matrix. That's why I call it D. And I just obtain this matrix by essentially applying U on both sides, if you like, of the matrix G. And if I write this with indices, this is how this looks like. So maybe I write it in blue. If I would just write the matrix multiplication, I would write D is equal to U times G times U transpose. That's what this means. The transpose comes from the fact that I multiply here for the second U, the second component with that. And of course, that means if I would write this thing here on the right hand side, that I have to exchange the two indices to have the usual matrix multiplication. So that's, I mean, that's probably the way you have seen it. And I now have just translated this into index notation. And the statement is this new matrix is diagonal. Okay, that's well known. And this is now something that we will exploit. Namely, I define now a new chart and I want that the metric looks particularly nice in the new chart. So. Um, usually when we define new charts, um, we say that it's an XJ. Um, okay, here I express the new chart in terms of the old ones. I may do that. I mean, of course, I could also express the, okay, the new chart is called U, it's tilde. I could also express it the other way around. 
but because a chart transition is always reversible, it doesn't matter in which way I define it. And it will just be more convenient for the purpose here to define how xj depends on x tilde i rather than the other way around. So this new chart, um, of course, is, relates the basis elements, the chart-induced basis vectors in the usual way. And maybe you remember if you want to now translate the components of a vector or a tensor written in terms of one chart into the other, we need usually multiplications with elements of this type, these partial derivatives of xj to the x tilde i and also their inverses. But here in this particular case, I don't need the inverse. And it's of course easy to calculate that, this um, particular derivative because it's just line a linear dependence anyway. So that's what I get. Now, the reason I'm doing all that is that I want to express the metric in the new chart, in the tilde chart, in terms of the old chart. And now I, of course, need exactly this transformation. So you remember a two, a zero two tensor translates in that way. And if you don't remember, you may at least hopefully see the system systematics here. So the tilde things appear, of course, whenever um, a lot, I mean, here we have lower indices with the tilde quantity. So these things have to be lower um, somewhere on the lower side. And these are upstairs. So if I multiply them, they have to be multiplied with something that is downstairs. And the only way I can satisfy that is by choosing these in that way. I mean, this is just a way to remember where the tildes are and where the indices are. Essentially, the only potentially com consistent way to write them down will, will be the correct one. Of course, one has to verify that it's the correct ones. But once this is done, you can remember it in that way. Now, I just insert what I've calculated above. I now have expression for this derivative. And the derivative is, of course, exactly this. Um, sim oh, actually, I forgot something. Here, I wanted to divide by square root of p. Um, let's call it d i i. Um, okay, just to be sure that it's the correct thing. Yeah, d i i. So. Um, well, the, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, I should already write here upstairs. Okay, so I just define it like that. Now it's well defined. I have defined what the DIIs are. These are the dialog, these are the entries of this new diagonalized matrix, and the U is the transition. So I now copy that. And of course, because this derivative appears twice, I get two such terms, one with an i and one with a j. So I have e i i and d j j. And then also the u appears twice, once with the i. And here I take an m upstairs as the summation index and once with the j. Here I take the summation index n as above. And then we get this expression. And now I can just compare this to what we have here. So we already know that u times gmn in this particular way with the indices gives again the diagonal matrix dij. So what I what we get here, this whole right hand side is just dij. But dij is only non-zero if um, if i is equal to j because it's a diagonal matrix. So I can just replace this essentially by d i i delta i j. So I could write this as d i i delta i j. It's the same because it's diagonal. And if I now rewrite everything in terms of d i i because of the delta function, i and j have to be the same. So I can just write this as the square of d i i and then the square root. And this importantly doesn't give us just d i i, but the absolute value of DII. And this term here just gives us what is written here. So DII 
and I write it like that, delta ij, because now I can claim that this number here is clearly either one or minus one. And that's obvious, whatever B is. I would only have a problem if bi i was also zero. This is, however, excluded by the property that the metric is non-degenerate. And non-degenerate, remember what it means? It means that if I put in one element into the metric, so if I put here just the u and leave the other one open, then there should be no u I could put in here such that the whole thing becomes zero. But if in a certain basis, these diagonal elements were such that at least for one diagonal, or if I had the situation that one diagonal element was zero, then of course I could just put in as a vector the corresponding um, eigenvector of that element corresponding to that diagonal element that this would be zero, which is not allowed by definition. So the non-degeneracy avoids here problems, and I always have this situation here. So what we have therefore found is the following. A metric tensor can always, by a appropriate choice of coordinate system, brought into a form where it has the form that it's diagonal, first of all. So it's diagonal, that's what this delta says. And all its diagonal entries are either ones or minus one. Now we will typically, in GR, I'll write this with another color because that's just now in space time physics. We write eta for this tensor, eta ij. Let me see where we were here. So this um, new. G tilde ij will just be written eta ij for g tilde ij. And what we have, eta ij is of the form that, I mean, I now naturally interpret, okay, okay, I'll write it correctly. It is of the form that it's only one for one entry and minus one for the others. So it's one if i equal j equals zero and minus one, minus one, minus one for the other three spatial dimensions. So this is if i equal j but not equal to zero, maybe I'll just write it like that. It's one, two, or three and zero otherwise. So this is just the case for if i is not equal to j. Okay, so let me um, explain what I did here because that may, I now mix the mathematical statement with the physical. So the purely mathematical statement, which is true for any manifold, even if it's not a space-time manifold, is that we can always find a coordinate system such that the metric tensor Gij is diagonal and has only diagonal elements one and minus one. Now this is not, I mean, maybe you have seen also diagonalization in quantum mechanics of, for example, unitary matrices or Hermitian matrices. There you cannot do that. You cannot diagonalize a Hermitian matrix in quantum mechanics in such a way that its diagonals are always one or minus one. And the reason why this doesn't work there, but it works here, is that the Hermitian matrix that you usually encounter in quantum mechanics is not a zero two tensor, but a one one tensor. And therefore its transformation rules are different. Whereas the metric is a zero two tensor and the zero two tensor transforms in this particular way that the diagonalization is possible in such a way that the eigenvalues are all one or minus one. That's essentially what we showed you. Now, the additional statement I made is that if we now go to the special case of space time, so this is a very particular manifold, namely a four dimensional manifold, then this, um, this metric, if you bring it into that form, will not have arbitrary ones or minus ones. It will have exactly one, one, and three minus ones. So this is also called, and this is, by the way, an invariant. So you will not be able to go into another 
um, coordinate system in which this is different. So um, maybe I should say that the, the diagonal values. Or the tuple of the diagonal values of this matrix of G I J is called the signature of the matrix. So what I Say so before again in orange means that the signature of space time is this tuple of diagonal values, which according to what I said here is one minus one minus one minus one. Now I should add that I could equivalently, and this is really just a bracket remark, I could equivalently say minus one, 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 one. This is just a different convention. So why can I say that? What I could do is to say that from the start, whatever I is defined as G, I just define now as minus G. So, there are somehow just different ways of measuring lengths. And the difference will be the following. In the convention that I will choose throughout this lecture, where we have this signature of space time, we essentially give a positive um, weight to time. So if you already think now of world lines, and that's what we will later do, and try to move that to a later discussion, but if you have the manifold, and let's suppose you already have somehow a um, chart of the manifold, where this is the x0 direction, which is usually seen as a time-like direction. And then we have all the other directions in the horizontal, because that's itself a three-dimensional thing, so that's that space. And if I now look at the world lines of a particle, so a world line of the particle is just the set of all space-time points, of all events that have the property that the particle passed there. And that's, of course, usually a line that looks like that, that's the world line. As you can never define it formally, we will probably in the physics part come back to it, or certainly, but you should already know a world line is defined in that way. Now, if you look at the world line, um, the direction vector will be something, of course, that in this picture looks like this. Let me do it with a different color because it's not the line, it's a different object, it's the direction vector. And the direction vector, of course, is in the tangent space. But if I now look at this direction vector, so that's the, let's say if the world line is called gamma, the direction vector is called V gamma. That's how we usually call the direction vectors. And if I now calculate the G of this vector, then you see that's a vector. I mean, if I have a, a um, slow particle, then of course it will have almost no spatial components. So there will be almost nothing in this direction and only an X0 component, which means that um, the time component here has most weight. And so if I calculate G, I get certainly something positive. Now it turns out that, and, and we will discuss that also in detail, that all world lines of particles have of massive particles have to have the property that this is positive. So that's what happens in our convention. But in this convention, if you now try to measure a so-called space-like vector, so one that points, for example, between two world lines. So if you're asking a different question, let's say you have here another world line of another particle, so this green one, and now you're asking what's the length of the minimal, what's the minimal length where they approach each other? Something like that. That you, you could also put a curve in between, or we'll just see what you could do is to put the geodesic and then ask how long is this geodesic? And to measure the length of this geodesic, you will have vectors that have almost no time component, but mostly spatial components. 
So they will pick up this part in the G if you put it, if you insert them into the G like here. And so this means with the convention we have here time like vectors. So those corresponding to directions in space time um, of world lines will be positive, whereas space like vectors will have a negative um, G. And um, just for completeness, we'll also come back to that later. So called time like vectors are those where it's exactly zero. These are the ones which somehow move equally fast in space and time so that these components just compensate. And so it's now just a matter of convention that you say it's more important, I mean, more important is even not necessary, but somehow if you more often talk about times, it's kind of convenient to give them a positive measure. And if you more often talk about space, it would be convenient to probably use this convention and just give spatial distance as a positive measure. We will go for that. And I hope in the course of the lecture, at least for our purposes, um, you will see that um, this is quite useful because we will more often talk about time rather than space. But this really depends on what you specialize on. There's not a general, um, let's say, favorite here that I have. I just find it for this lecture more useful to go with this convention. Now, just the last word about terminology. I mentioned that we call these manifolds that we are treating pseudo Riemannian manifolds. And pseudo refers to the fact that this, um, the G is not positive definite. If the G was positive definite, which means that this thing here is always positive for any vector I put in, then of course the signature has only ones in them. And now we say that um, if the, more generally we can say that if the signature of a metric G is such that you have only ones, we call it the Riemannian manifold, and if the signature doesn't have this property, we call it generally a pseudo Riemannian manifold. If the signature has the property that it has exactly this signature, which is the one that is interesting for space time, then we call it a Lorentzian manifold. So Lorentzian manifold is what we are interested in in GR, which is a special case, again, of a general pseudo Riemannian manifold. So pseudo Riemannian could have two ones and two minus ones and even be higher dimensional. If I have exactly one, one, and the others minus one, or depending on the convention, this situation, we call it Lorentz. Okay, this was a lot of terminology and so on, and um, mixed in with a bit of physical meaning, but we will come back to that as I said a bit later. But now we should know that what the signature of a metric is. Now, I didn't prove formally that the signature is actually an invariant, but indeed it is the case that if you have a metric, um, it has to, first of all, always be the same in the following. I mean, okay, it's invariant in several ways. So if you are somewhere on the manifold and you're asking, and you say, oh, the signature of the metric is now one minus one minus one, it's, a, it's this Laurentian metric. Could it be that in another place on the manifold, the signature is different? And the answer is no, this cannot be. For because and the reason is a, is a very simple one, the metric has to be a smooth tensor field. So remember, a metric is a tensor at every point of the manifold, but it's smooth, which means it can only change continuously. But it also has to be non-degenerate. And if you would want to flip, for example, from this one to one which has two ones here, you would at some point have to pass the zero. I mean, okay, this is now an informal, this is a kind of hand wave explanation, and I don't want to give you the detailed proof, this is mathematics, but at some point you have to pass um, through the zero thing, so you will go through this degenerate metric, which is not allowed, because the metric has to be non-degenerate everywhere. So you simply cannot in a smooth way go from a place in the manifold where the metric has this signature to one where it has a different signature. Also, what you cannot do is to find the different phases in which the signature is different. And this just follows from this from linear algebra that essentially the way you um, that this, I mean, that you can diagonalize a matrix is more or less unique. Or you see it also here to change the sign of a matrix. 
would require that you multiply the metric somewhere with a minus one or to change the sign of a diagonal element. But if you want to multiply it with a minus one, you have to put the minus one either here or here, but because they are the same, if you if if the metric is already diagonal, then this will act on the same thing. You will not be able to get a minus one. You would need a complex number here, but we in GR we are not allowing complex um, um, transformation. This is simply not defined. Okay, so therefore what you should now get from that or remember from what I told you is that the signature is something that is universally defined. This is not a coordinate dependent property. It's really a physics property. And it just turns out that space time has this signature here. This is really just an experimental fact. Now you could ask why space time not one, one, minus one, minus one. What would that even mean? Would it mean we would have a two dimensional time direction? And here I simply cannot give an answer. I mean, I don't think there is any reasonable physical theory, even a, a hypothetical one, um, where you have here two time directions. At least I haven't seen any that comes close to something that can be explained in nature. Of course, you can purely mathematically introduce that, but it's, it's not even clear what it would mean physically. So we have to essentially take this as a postulate of GR. The signature of the metric of space-time is that one, is the Lorentzian signature. That's our postulate. Of course, this postulate only makes physical sense once you know what, the, what this metric really measures, but we will come to that. Are there questions so far to that? Otherwise, I would um, go on with something slightly different and then return to the lengths of curves and so on a bit later. Maybe today I should particularly motivate you to actually ask questions during the lecture because again, like last time, I have to leave right after the lecture and actually I have to leave at half past five. This time not for a talk somewhere else, but um, we have evaluators in our department. You know, sometimes they are external experts making sure that what we are doing in research and teaching all makes sense. And this is quite important to us and I have to meet with these evaluators at half past five. They have a quite constrained schedule. So there was unfortunately no flexibility. So I propose that we just work through the break and then stop exactly at half past five. So please, if you have questions, just interrupt me at any time and don't wait for the break. It will, it will simply not make the break. Okay, but let me now continue and, and you can just think about your questions. Um, I would like now to briefly discuss something completely, I mean, not completely different, we're still doing differential geometry, but something which we can now do and couldn't do before, which is the geometric meaning of torsion. So I just told you several times that it's another postulate of GR that the torsion is zero. Now, this probably well, doesn't tell you much. What does it mean the torsion is zero from this math? I mean, mathematically, you know what it means, but what does it mean physically? Now we said before, or remember that the torsion is something that is defined purely based on the notion of parallel transport. And parallel transport is an experiment. Parallel transport has to do with, I said that several times, take a gyroscope and just move it to another point and see, um, and by definition, so to speak, the direction of what the gyroscope has here is then connected to a direction that it has somewhere else. And this is called the parallel transport. So the gyroscope induces a structure on space time, which defines for every path I can take how the direction here relates to the direction somewhere else. And please don't think of it like it tells you how the direction changes because there is no reference. It just tells you the direction here, um, if it is like that, corresponds to, if I move it to this place here, I move it here, to this direction. That's what it means to stay equal. Even if you now would say, oh, this looks like different. Now it was upright and here not. But in space time, you don't have an outer reference. It's just by definition the same, because it's just the gyroscope that kept its direction that I moved from here to here. And this, so this parallel transport that we call tau captures this mathematically. 
Now, we already used that thing to design or to get a geometric meaning of curvature. Maybe what we said is if I go, if I take such a gyroscope and move along a loop and ask myself, how much did the gyroscope change its direction? Now I can compare it because I return to the same point. Here it's now well defined to ask about the change. Then um, this change is given, is very directly related to the curvature tensor. Maybe it's essentially the curvature times the area of that loop with the right indices and so on. You have seen that. Now for the meaning of the torsion, we do a very similar thing. And I'll just make that, explain that only on an informal level, but the proof is given in the lecture notes. The proof is very similar to the one of the um, curvature. It involves, however, the notion of straight lines. So that was the reason why we couldn't do it before. But the idea is the following. So I will just draw a diagram and not write much more. Take a point P on the manifold. So the manifold is now my whiteboard. And move and think of a coordinate system being here in such a way that we have two vectors, which I am interested in. Of course, the coordinate system may have more, but two basis vectors may be the one in the m direction. So d to the dm is a vector that points into the direction that I run if I only change the m coordinate of my coordinate system. And then there is another vector, d to the dxn, which is the same just for the coordinate m. Now, suppose that I take a gyroscope in this direction, in the m direction, and now follow a straight line exactly in the direction of the gyroscope. So I move here in this direction and the line should be straight. Now I deliberately didn't draw a straight a line that looks straight on, on this whiteboard. This is just to indicate, of course, the whole manifold could be curved and what is called a straight line. For example, if I move on the Earth's surface, it's not really a straight line if you would look at it from the outside. But straight means, remember that, that's what we defined last time. If I take that initial vector here and transport it with this transformation map that I just told you about before, so that's this transport map. I apply this transport map to the vector d to the dxm. And maybe I should here indicate this is the vector at the point p. So I take the vector at the point P, but now transported with the transport map tau along the curve that I call gamma. So gamma should be this curve along which I walk. So essentially, this is really something very easy to do. This is what you do if you're told to just walk straight. And suppose you have no reference. There's not a straight street you can follow. Then the only, I mean, not the only way, but let's suppose um, if you don't even have the floor that helps you and keeping the wheel straight or something like that. What you could still do is to take a gyroscope, orient it origin, or take its direction as your initial starting direction and always follow exactly the direction of that gyroscope. And that's what you do in this experiment. So this is different from the loop we looked at in the case of curvature, because there we, we essentially could talk about an arbitrary loop where we just looked at in a coordinate system. So here it doesn't mean so despite the fact that at the beginning you follow the direction of the M coordinate change, it doesn't mean that you continue following the M coordinate change. Because, I mean, what could happen really is that, I mean, and you could even think of the Earth surface as an example, but let's suppose I take now a coordinate system which first points exactly towards you in the M direction. But now this coordinate system could be um, oriented in, or could be designed in such a way, maybe because I have curved coordinates, that it actually turns left. It's maybe some circular coordinates. So if I followed the coordinate line, I would just turn left like that. But in this experiment, I take the initial direction in the end and just follow that one. So I may deviate from the coordinate line. So the coordinate line is essentially not important. It's just a straight line. But now what I could also do is to take with me the sec a second gyroscope, namely the one that corresponds to the n direction. I also transport that. And maybe if I'm here, it looks maybe like this. 
So that could be could be the transport, it's the same transport operation. So I still go along the M direction, but I take with me a gyroscope that initially pointed into the N direction. Okay, so I take it with me. Now I go along the M direction in that way with my two gyroscopes, one which points in the direction and one that points in a different direction. So it's like this, so I walk here. And the blue pen here is, or you see it probably as a black one. The, the pen, the black one points in another direction, but I take it with me. And I walk for a certain parameter value, u. So, I mean, you could even think now of measuring the distance in terms of this g, if you like, but um, we can just walk in a certain direction for an amount u. So we, for an amount u, we go in this direction here. And then once I arrived, once I've, I've, I'm, I have gone for a certain distance, I turn and follow the direction of the other gyroscope I took with me. Maybe at this point, the gyroscope in the meantime points in this direction a bit left up. Now I do the same thing, but following this gyroscope, and maybe I do something like this. I still take the other gyroscope also with me. So I always have these two things. So here this may look like this. Of course, it's now a straight line according to that one. And that was the original one. So that's now the transport one as d to the dxm. And the other arrow, which points along the curve, is the transported one of the in direction. And now, after a certain distance v in this direction, I'm do it in green. So I walk a parameter distance v, I turn again and follow again into. Uh -huh. Now, this was maybe not a good idea. Let me draw. I mean, let's suppose it doesn't change that drastically. So if this point's still a bit to the right, even if I transported it, let's suppose it still somehow points some to the right. So this is still the transported one of the initial direction M transported up to this point. Now I follow again this one in the negative direction. So I go into minus U and finally I turn again and go into minus V direction. So, okay. This, this was a very complicated explanation. It's actually very simple. I follow the white pen, walk a certain time, take the blue with me as a gyroscope, now follow the blue for a certain time, then I follow the white backwards and follow the blue backwards. Now the question is, if I do that, do I arrive at the point where I started? So this may not be the case. Of course, if everything was flat and so on. So if you are in, in Cartesian, I mean, not flat because it could be flat, but half torsion, but in Cartesian space where the torsion is zero and the curvature is zero, clearly if I do that, I just make a rectangle. I just walk along a rectangle with side lengths u and v. And obviously I arrive at the same position. So maybe I'll draw that as well, just to make sure you understand. So in flat torsion free case, the experiment look at from above would look like this. I will look like this, then like this, like this, and like this. But in, in a general manifold, it may not close. And I may now ask, what's the distance here? The delta, so to speak, between the two points. And that's really what the torsion tells me. So what does the torsion tell me more precisely? The torsion, what is delta, the orange thing, I'll define as follows. It of course depends on u and v. If I make a very small loop, this delta will be very small. But, and also actually the curve gamma depends on u and v because u and v tell me how much I walk in each direction. So the, the, the delta is defined as the starting point, gamma zero, the ice coordinate. So the ice, so the delta has an index i. And delta i is defined as the i's coordinate point where I started minus the i's coordinate point of the curve. So the curve depends on u and v, as I said, after I walk the full rectangle. So the full rectangle, I first walk into the direction u, then v, then again parameter length u, and then again v. 
So that's essentially the end point of the curve. If I write it like that, so the start, that's the an end. And okay, this this is how I define this delta more formal. And now the statement is the claim, which I will not prove, but as I said, is proved in the lecture notes, is that this delta is given by the torsion. And how is it given? It's given by the torsion I. The torsion has three indices. One index I need for the I. Of course, it depends which direction of the delta I look at. So the delta I just means it's a deviation in the I direction. And then it also has two other indices, M and N, because obviously the way I will not close may depend on which directions I started walking into. And that was for the coordinate directions. So the claim is that it's proportional to U times V times this thing, and then plus higher order terms. So higher order terms could mean like U to the three or V to the three or u to the two times v or u times v to the two, everything that involves three factors, either u or v. So in other words, we have now understood what the torsion means. The torsion really tells you to that lowest order. There's no lower order terms than that one. So if u or v is zero, if you just walk in one direction and back, nothing changes. But the torsion tells you that if you walk in such, if you try to walk in a circle, I mean, that's what you would do if you're kind of lost somewhere and want to at least make a circle. Maybe you're in the desert and want to find something, um, let's say some source of water, but you want to make sure maybe you have somewhere they deposited things. So you want, at least if you don't find the source, return to where you started. So you walk in the, uh, along you, you take this gyroscope, then walk in another direction, then back and again, um, back to you, so you try to make a rectangle and the torsion tells you by how much you missed that goal at the end. Now, as I, I mean, this is now something you could in principle do also in space time. Of course, I haven't talked about what the time component really means, but you can at least do it with the spatial core um, component. So you can do these walks and then with that map out space time. And as I said, um, it's just an axiom or a postulate or an experimental finding, if you like, that space time has no torsion, which means that to that order, to the lowest order, we are not talking about that one. This may depend on the curvature, but in lowest order, this does not, you will actually close such loops. That's what this whole thing says. Okay, that, um, so you have to probably get used to the fact that to really get an intuition, I always return to the earth surface and stuff like that, to two dimensions where we walk. And of course, I have to admit that I don't have a good intuition what this whole thing really means in four dimensional space time, because I find it personally very hard to think in four dimension. But that's why I think we are, I mean, we are kind of lucky that many of the things that occur in GR can be understood by projecting down into lower dimensions. And somehow, at least it gives you as a feeling of what's going on when you're looking at these things in, the two in a two-dimensional space and just now can see, okay, torsion means more or less that. Apparently, space-time has an analog property just in higher dimensions. But I would certainly not claim that I have a picture in my mind of how this really looks in four dimensions. There's certainly people who do have that, but I don't think I belong to them. And these are probably those people who, who can draw, for example, four dimensional, the projection of a four dimensional cube in three dimensions. And um, if you ever went to the Technorama in Winterthur, you will find such a thing, which is quite interesting to look at. But that's just, um, yeah something to show. I mean, if you look at it, it's really hard to imagine how the four-dimensional thing should look like. Okay, now I'll um, Could say you something. Go down on the right hand side a bit. Oh, uh -huh, yes, sure. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. And as I said, please um, interrupt if there are questions. I now continue with something I already started 
introducing last time, and I think the reason I introduced that already last time is that it was desperately needed also for the exercises. And I introduced the Levi Civita connection. And I want to discuss that a bit more because this is really something that connects all the things um, that, I mean, connects now not as a connection, um, the word connect in a different, it relates different things. Namely, it relates the metric that we now just discussed. The metric is um, this object that has a G and it to something we call an affine connection. Now, these are two different things. The affine connection is the thing that tells us how parallel transport works. And now remember the physical meanings. For the metric, I, I told you this will have something to do with, for example, proper time. So I can, I can measure it by clocks. So it's really measured by clocks. So that's what we really do in practice, in, in real experience. The affine connection it has something to do with these experiments we just discussed now at length. So they have to do with um, parallel transport. And therefore, we could measure it by gyroscopes. So there are kind of two different things. However, what, we, what the levi civita connection tells us is that in space, and this is what is actually true in space time, is that these are not just two different things. We don't introduce a metric, and then we are happy with the metric of measuring time and so on and spatial distances. And on the other hand, we introduce a connection which tells us how things are keep being oriented. So they are not just two independent structures, they're actually related in a very strong sense. Actually, in the sense where one determines the other almost completely. And this is um, this relation is given by the following conditions, which were the condition, conditions that led us to the Levi Civita connection. So, if we say that, first of all, so let's suppose we start from the metric and say that the manifold should be torsion free. Of course, the metric by itself didn't talk about torsion. It doesn't talk about direction. So we, let's suppose we start from the metric and say the manifold should also be torsion free. And it should have the property that if I parallelly transport the metric itself, so I apply the tau to the g along a curve gamma. So I will just tell you what that means. But I apply, I transport the metric, then it will not change. Then the left-hand side, the metric completely determines the connection here. So in other words, this object, the object that is, as I said at the beginning here, if you remember the object is defined by measuring only things that like the lengths of vectors. And it's sufficient to measure lengths of vectors as I argued here, and because that really corresponds to lengths. So the thing that is defined by lengths and, and times completely determines how things are parallelly transported. If we require that if I parallelly transport the metric, then it shouldn't change. And if I require that the manifold is torsion free. So what does this really mean? So the torsion free, I think I explained now also in detail, torsion free just means that loops close if they are constructed in a way I just described with this story. So if, if I find back to my place where I started, if I'm lost in the desert and have gyroscopes with me, and the other condition is this one, that the metric doesn't move. Now, this is maybe a bit hard to grasp at first sight. What does it mean that parallelly transporting the metric doesn't change it? But it's actually not um, yeah, that hard to understand because what you could do, maybe this is just a remark on two, is um, to instead think of the transport of vectors. So remark in two is the following. So more precisely, what does it mean that the metric doesn't move? It means that if I take a curve, an arbitrary curve in space time, and I apply it to the metric G. And now, of course, what does, then I get, of course, a new metric. 
And the matrix I can always apply to, now maybe I should be even more detailed. So this tau always have parameters. So I have a curve with a curve parameter t and I, this tau gamma u t means that it's a parallel transport of starting at curve parameter t and going up to curve param parameter u. And now I do that with the matrix. I take it with me in this parallel transport. And once I've transported the matrix, I'm at a different point. So here I'm initially at the point gamma of t. So this is where I start to take the matrix. This is where I take the matrix. Now I transport it. But now the transported matrix is at gamma of u. So I can now measure vectors. Let's say I make a vector x that is at the point gamma u and another vector. I mean, because the matrix takes two arguments, gamma u. But now the claim is that oh, this whole thing is actually the same as if I didn't apply um, the tau. I mean, now introducing this, I just can drop this tau. So it just means it's g of at gamma u because it has to be gamma u. I don't change the argument by gamma u. But now remember that the way we actually defined the, um, the transport of a matrix was to say we just transport its arguments. So actually, maybe it's actually better if I move this a bit up. Oops, that didn't work. So what I could do is. I write the definition of the metric before that. So I'm sorry for this. I hope you somehow find space if you're taking notes to fit that in. This thing here is the same as just taking the metric and evaluate it on the transported vec on the backwards transported vectors. So let me write it and then it's probably clear to you. So I could equivalently take G of T and now apply it to the transport, but in the opposite direction of the vectors x gamma u and i need to do that for both vectors so i also need to transport the vector y of gamma u okay so what this equality that i now add it tells you is that rather than moving the metric from t to u i can just take the vectors at u transport them back to t and measure them there and now if you look at the overall equality that we now proved, so essentially the fact that the first term is equal to the last one, let's do it differently. So if you now, of course, you now prove that these two things are equal. This means the following. If you just read this term and this term tells you the following. If I measure how long these vectors are at the point u of the curve, and now I take the two vectors and transport them to the point T of the curve and measure again their lengths. Then the, this length shouldn't have changed. So in other words, this criterion G just means that as I parallelly transport things, their lengths don't change. And again, for the reason I said at the very beginning, it's sufficient to talk about lengths. This implies even if I put different arguments. So. If you now go back to that, if you have a metric given, only a metric and no, um, no transport, the transport is completely determined by requiring that you are torsion free and that the lengths of things don't change if you transport them. This uniquely determines the affine connection. So that's very nice because it actually tells us that we need not so much structure as we may have so. So originally, before that, you could have thought, okay, I need something to measure lengths because in space time at the end, we need to measure time and length. So we need a metric, but we also need to somewhere define how things are parallelly transported, but they are now the same. And the particular connection that arises in this way, so if I start from here in the way I said and take these conditions and arrive here, is called the Levy Chivita connection. So it's that particular thing. Now I also said last time that we have an explicit expression for this connection. So remember, a connection 
which is the parallel transport, is essentially formally defined by the gamma symbols. And I now should, of course, be able to give you a formula. So if I told you we can, in a unique way, go from here to here, we need a formula. This formula you already saw last time. I'll just write it down again, because we will need it. So the formula is the following. Maybe I'll write it in by on the right hand side this because we have the connection on the right hand side so on the right hand side we have the connection which is completely determined by these gamma symbols and now on the left hand side we have something that only depends on the metric and the particular formula is that we have first um, a multiplication with the inverse metric and then we have a sum of three different um, combinations of how i can put the indices to the metric and as I said, this is something you should at some point probably learn by heart if you want to do GR, because it occurs so often that it's a pain to always look it up. But um, you see the symmetry, by the way, it's already obvious from this expression that this thing will be symmetric in I and J. So it will have indeed torsion zero. Because if you exchange I and J, because G itself is symmetric in the first arguments, if I exchange here i and j, I get k j comma i, but or k yes, and k j comma i is the same as j k j k comma i. So k j comma i is the same as j k comma i, and um, this term is anyway symmetric because the i and j appear first in the i and j. So it's obvious that this is symmetric. It's also a simple calculation which I'm not presenting here will show you that if you indeed take now the covariant derivative, so you want to show that this thing holds, um, what do you have to show? And maybe I write this here. This is equivalent to say that the covariant derivative of G is equal to zero. But to calculate the covariant derivative of G, you remember the covariant derivative of G are along a direction. Um, can be done in the following. So maybe I'll write this here. Easy to verify. And again, you find the details in the lecture notes. First of all, that gamma n i j is equal to gamma n j i. That's what I said. And the other thing is that if I now take the derivative, so if I take the metric and I take the metric the covariant derivative in direction k. So remember the semicolon notation. What this means is that I take the covariant in direction k and then look at the i's and j's component. We have seen that this is essentially given by just taking the partial derivative and then minus about two gamma symbols. So it involves now gamma symbols. One is, um, okay. Um, not sure. Let me write it down for completeness. So one gamma symbol is I and then a summation index, let's call it M. And um, I think then I will have here the G, J, and here the direction K, and M, and then another one where it's the other way around, where I and J are interchanged by M. Now, of course, the, now you need to work, it would need to work a bit because these gamma symbols you now need to replace by these expressions. But if you do that, then you will see that it's zero. So that's a, here these dots mean there's some simple calculation, just inserting the expression. The opposite direction can also be shown. So what I now told you is that once you define the connection like this, then indeed, it has the desired properties in the sense that it's torsion free and that it's um, that its covariant derivative is zero, therefore that its parallel transport of G will not um, G will be invariant on the parallel transport. Now another thing we need to verify is that it's that's unique. And maybe that's something you yeah, know let me not show it. I will also refer to the script because I want to focus on something else today. And I can still show you it to you later in case you desire so. Um, so the uniqueness essentially of this expression. So I, when I write down this 
expression I mentioned last time that it's unique. So the, this is the only connection um, that is determined by the metric. Because a priori it could be that the metric together with these requirements doesn't uniquely determine the parallel transfer, but it's really unique and it's only that one. So for the uniqueness, I just refer to the lecture notes. Now these particular gamma symbols are called the Christoffel symbols. So remember, before we had something more general. So when we started discussing the topic of affine connections, we didn't talk about the metric at all. So the affine connection could be defined just independently of a metric. And there, I just talked about the gamma symbols. Now, these, these are very special gamma symbols, those that are given by a metric. And these gamma symbols, I will refer to as the Christoffel symbols. OK, so that, I think, um, hopefully gives you, and at least makes clear to you how these two things are now related to each other. But please let me know if, if there is any question here at this point. Because otherwise, I will again move to something slightly different. Today, I have. Um, to I have a question. Things. Yes, please. Um, how did we arrive to the expression of the uh, Christoffel symbols? How we derived it? Okay, we didn't. Oops. Okay. We didn't derive <laughs> it. So actually, um, I just claimed it, and now I said it's unique. So this is part of, let's say, um, of that thing, but. Um, Yes, so I'll just refer you to the lecture notes. Maybe the only thing I, I can say as an overview of the proof or the proof idea, because the proof is mainly a calculation. What you're actually doing for the proof is just that you're explicitly writing down G. So I, I have actually written this expression here um, for Gij semicolon K. Now you want this to be zero. So that's an expression we already know. That's just the general covariant derivative. Now in order, there's a trick actually used. And the trick is to just write down this line three times. But you write it with, an, with permuted symbols here. So if once you write gij semicolon k, then once gjk semicolon i, and then the third um, rotation. So you write all of them, and then you add the first two and subtract the third, essentially. So what you do, I mean, I will not do it now, but just as a, as a hint, then you see the rest you could do my, yourself, because it's somehow hard to find out this trick. I don't know who discovered it. The trick is just calculate this. It's probably something when you look at the formula long enough, you will see that it's useful to write in that way because then terms cancel. Um, so you just write down this, and this has to be zero because each individual term is zero. That must be the case. But now you insert into each of them this expression, and then many terms will cancel, and the only term that will remain is one term gamma. And the other terms that remain are actually exactly um, terms of that type. And so you, you get the solution. So I think from here, you can arrive. So the, the receipt, take this, insert that, and solve it for gamma, and then you get it. But I didn't do it here. So if you don't know, I mean, don't look for the calculation in my um, notes here. but. Of course, you find them in the lecture notes on the on the web in the text notes. I hope that's fine for you for the moment. Um, yeah. So that just means that we have like two physical constraints, which is like space time is torsion free and the parallel transport is zero. And then mm -hmm. we do the calculation, and then we get the symbol. Yes, right. So indeed, okay. I mean, actually, the way this this goes in, so this zero, this equals zero is um, using the fact that um, the parallel transport of the metric um, or the, the metric is staying invariant. 
when I said you can actually then get rid of many terms when we insert this thing here for that. Then you have, in that calculation, you have to use the symmetry of the gamma symbols, which is implied by the torsion theory. So this is where the other condition comes into play. Okay. Now, um, a again, different chapters. So as I said, today is a bit a mix of different things, but this will all prepare us to something important. And there are many elements needed. I already introduced the Ricci curvature before, but there's also something else, namely the curvature scalar or the Ricci scalar as it's called. And that one I couldn't introduce before. And let me just define it. So first, as, just to remember, the Ricci tensor is a zero two tensor, which component wise could be written as a contraction of the Riemann tensor. That's something we already did. That's called the Ricci curvature. So now I wrote it down in terms of components. I could also write it down in the component free way. But now the new object I want to define is R. And R is Gij times the Ricci tensor Ij. And you see, if I now apply the summation convention, I get a scalar because I sum over both indices. So this is the Ricci scalar, also called the curvature or scalar curvature. Now, why could I define this already earlier and not this thing here? I mean, this is probably um, something you should, could ask yourself. Why didn't I, did I wait until now? Or why, you know, why did I wait until now to introduce this Ricci scale? The reason is that this object can be defined purely based on a connection. I don't need the metric. And you know, the metric is something we only introduced last week. So I simply couldn't define it. So the curve, the generally the, the affine connection has less structure than saying, oh, we have a metric and then take the Levin Civita connection, which is a very, very special connection. So if you only have connection, um, we could only define this because here explicitly the metric comes into play. I mean, here at this contraction could be done because one index was up and one down already. But here for the Rij, I cannot contract indices without another object that has, um, has indices upstairs. Okay, now we could say, okay, I could define anything. Why should I define this? And the reason why I define this R, R why I'm even interested in it, I mean, there are several reasons, but one main reason is that I can just use it for another definition. Namely, I can define again a two, a zero two tensor, Ij, which you may remember because I already talked about this G at the very beginning of the course. And it's defined like this. And this is called, and the name says probably already a lot, it's called the Einstein tensor. And of course it will play a key role in the Einstein field equation. So first of all, why is it a tensor? It's a tensor because this thing is a zero. So it's a zero two tensor because this is a zero two tensor. And this here is also a zero two tensor because of course G is a zero two tensor and R is just a scalar. So um, this whole thing, the addition of two zero two tensors is again a zero two tensor. And okay, I'll come to that of course later again back, but I mentioned already last time that we can introduce the Einstein field equations in vacuum. Now I can tell you what the Einstein field equations are in general. And of course, this will, we will have a whole chapter devoted to the Einstein field equations. So consider this still kind of as an outlook. We have I mean, an outlook in the sense that we approach the Einstein field equation. I already mentioned them in the very first lecture. And now we are much closer to them because the Einstein field equations have this form here. G, which is exactly this Einstein tensor times, and this is a completely different G. This has nothing to do with the Einstein field equations. This is just the um, Newton constant. That's why I put this in here. Um, and then 
um, here times t i j, and this t is the energy momentum. Okay, that's not very readable. Um, what we now have achieved in the lecture so far is we have a full understanding of the left hand side. I mean, we have now the full mathematical formalism to really know what's going on here on the left hand side. We will do quite, have to do quite some work to also understand the right hand side. However, we can now already do a lot because. Just assume, I mean, it's a bit like in Maxwell's equations, even before you can solve the Maxwell equations, I can already give you, for example, an electromagnetic field and tell you now, given this electromagnetic field, what's the trajectory of a particle? And the same is something we can also do here. So the G here, this is the curvature somehow, of course, it's a combination of the of these curvature tensors. So at the end, this is an expression for the geometry. So you could also see G for geometry. And, and even without now solving the equation, if I give you a geometry, we can already ask the question, what's the trajectory of particles? And actually the short answer will be trajectories of particles which are not subject to any force are straight lines. But straight lines with respect to the manifold, I mean, with respect to that curvature. So you know now a straight line is not something that is um, really looks straight. If you look from the outside, it's straight in the sense we define. So we have all these notions. We can now talk about how things move in space time. And therefore, if I now give you, for example, the G of a black hole, which we can now understand, you can already ask yourself, what's the trajectory if you now, for example, fall into a black hole? Or you can ask the question, where is the place you no longer can get out of? It? So we are now in that sense already quite far. I just, um, I will not do that today. So the black holes will certainly be something we'll discuss in detail, but um, I just want to make um, a connection to something I said earlier, because I said in vacuum, um, we can already we could already understand this equation without writing G. I just wrote the Ricci tensor. And why could I do that? So I'll just put a small note. And the note is the following. I can, of course, multiply the equation on both sides with the metric. And this is just um, mathematically something that is allowed to do. So I'll do that. Um, and okay, let me okay only do it for vacuum. Then it's a bit easier, and it serves the purpose for the vacuum solution. Note on the vacuum on vacuum solution. So vacuum means that p i j is equal to zero. There will also be later a, a gravitation or a cosmological constant, but we don't care about it now. This can also be formally included into the, um, into T, if you like. So I multiply this nevertheless. And of course, um, if the left, if it's zero, um, then also the multiplication with G remains zero. But what does the multiplication with G really mean? So I multiply the Ricci, the Ricci tensor. Um, oh, I think I wanted to write it out. Ricci IJ minus one half times r and now i have g i j g i j downstairs what's this here so if, if you look at this object g i j g i j that's just if i contracted only the j index i would just get the delta function of i j so i get delta i uh, sorry the delta function i i now but what's the delta function i i? This is really summing over the delta function. This just gives four because we are in four dimensional space time. Now we are in space time when I talk about Einstein's field equation. What's this? This is by definition just the Ricci scale, which I already called R. So on the whole right hand side, 
what we have is essentially um, R minus two R. But we know in vacuum, this has to be zero. So in other words, our conclusion is in the vacuum solution, the Ricci scalar is equal to zero. But if the Ricci scalar is equal to zero, then of course, G is just identical to the Ricci tensor because this term just vanishes. So therefore we have G I J is equal to R to the Ricci tensor I J. And therefore the Einstein field equations can so Einstein field equation therefore takes the form Ricci tensor I J equal to zero. This is why I could in the vacuum case, already before we had a metric, which allowed us to introduce this G and so on, talk about the Einstein field equation. Okay, this connection is anyway, something we will come back to. But please remember that. So remember that in the, if you have such an equation, and if you put the right hand side zero, then it's equivalent. So to say GIJ is zero is equivalent to say that the Ricci um, curvature is equal to zero. Okay, now I see the time is run. So I should really leave at half past. I hope you remind me if I forget that. Um, I'll have to, now, again, talk about a different topic, which is um, the length of curves. And that's something you've already seen in the exercises. But what I want to discuss here is that the length of curve is really an invariant. So what's the length of a curve? And this definition was something that um, I haven't in the lecture introduced, but you probably know it already from classical mechanics and or from um, yeah, I mean, certainly from classical mechanics and maybe also from some geometry lectures. So what's the length of a curve? So let's look at the curves. And that's something that is, of course, um, if you saw it before, it was just defined not on a curved space time, time but the definition for a curved space time is essentially the, the same as the definition you have just for a normal space equipped with a metric um, where you um, may have seen the following expression. The length L, capital length of a curve gamma is just the integral. And so I assume that the curve is a curve segment actually from A to B, parameter values A to B. So um, I do the integration from there to there. And I just measure essentially the tangent vector of the curve, which is this thing in our notation. And the length, as I told you before, is measured by the G. And then I integrate this length of the tangent vector D, oops, DT. So in other words, I, as I walk, I always look what, how long is my tangent vector and I sum these up. So an integral is essentially a summing up. And this is really the way you should understand it physically. You should physically, I think I mentioned that, that the, maybe not in, in this lecture, but those who have had different lectures with me that the physics um, is never, I mean, the range of applicability is never to infinitely small scales. This is in particular, true for GR, it's, you cannot apply GR to cases where quantum mechanics becomes relevant. And so it doesn't actually matter if you, if you check, think of the integral of a sum of many small objects, and you don't even need to go really to the limits. So what this, if you think of this as a sum, it's really the sum, if instead of the curve, you kind of map out the curve by the small vectors, you just put the vectors next to each other and you sum up the lengths of all these little vectors, then of course you get the lengths of the curve. And that's how you should intuitively think of this expression. here. It's really just decomposing the curve into things we can measure. We can only measure straight things. So think of, of a meter stick, which is straight. And if you have to measure the lengths of a, really a curved curve, then you have to subdivide it into small parts and just measure with the meter stick little segments which are approximately straight. And that's exactly this thing here. 
Now, um, I will not have time for the proof for the following. I can do that proof next time on Thursday, but let me make a statement. So the statement is just that L is invariant under reparametrizations. So what that means is that if I take a new curve, so I have curve gamma tilde, which has, of course, now, because it has a different parameter, it also has different parameter values from which it starts and where it ends, 2n. So it's, it's, got, it's a curve in the same manifold, but it takes a parameter t tilde. And the curve should be just defined by first mapping t tilde to the t of the previous parametrization and then apply the previous curve. So essentially the reparametrization is just given by a function t, which um, maps the interval of the new curve parameter, which is a tilde parameter, to the interval of the of the t parameter, so the t, the t parameter as in um, should be in the interval a b as before, and it should be monotonous. So if I reparameterize the curve, I should never run backwards, which means that if I take the derivative of this reparameterization, so if I express the new or the old parameter t in terms of the new one, and take the derivative, this should always be strictly positive. And now. Um, the claim is therefore, if I take now L of gamma, then it's really just exactly the same as L of gamma tilde. And maybe we can next time make a voting and depending on the outcome, I can show you the proof, or maybe you also want to read it until then. <laughs>